Chapter 1. Hatred, Good or Evil All passions have a phase when they are merely disastrous, when they drag down their victim with the weight of stupidity, and a later, much later phase, when they wed the spirit, when they spiritualize themselves. Formerly, in view of the element of stupidity in passion, war was declared on passion itself, its destruction was plotted, all the old moral monsters are agreed on this. Il fatue la passion. The most famous formula for this is to be found in the New Testament, in that Sermon on the Mount, where, incidentally, things are by no means looked at from a height. There it is said, for example, with particular reference to sexuality, If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. Fortunately, no Christian acts in accordance with this precept, destroying the passions and cravings merely as a preventative measure against their stupidity and the unpleasant consequences of this stupidity. Today, this itself strikes us as merely another acute form of stupidity. Friedrich Nietzsche, Twilight of the Idols Hatred as Intrinsic Moral Evil Darkness cannot drive out darkness, said Dr. Martin Luther King. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Nelson Mandela. No one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin, or his background, or his religion. People learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love, for love comes more naturally to the human than its opposite. Attributed to him, among various others, is the aphorism that hating is like swallowing poison and hoping it kills your enemy. Mother Teresa followed a similar script. If you judge someone, you have no time to love them. Perhaps judging is not synonymous with hate, but it is certainly a prerequisite, and still frames love not merely as a good, but as something owed to all. And, of course, there is Gandhi. Anger and intolerance are the enemies of correct understanding. Being moral saints of the modern age, these patrons of inclusion and diversity have set a tone for what our expected relationship with hatred is to be, or perhaps they are merely a product of that expectation. For us, it makes no difference. What is important is whether they are right. We are told that hatred is unproductive, and worse, that it is the source of the very things we are fighting all around the globe, destruction, violence, division, and despair. It makes us no better than them. We are told that hatred is the opposite of love. Compassion, understanding, and empathy are the solution. War is not the answer. This is the endless message of the media, of politicians, of school administrators, and worried citizens, eager to show they are not one of them. Them, of course, not being known or understood explicitly, but broadly acknowledged as hateful people. Even the Bible, moral compass and map for many, appears to say that hatred is wrong. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. This belief can be seen on a smaller scale, more personal instances too. I remember growing up hearing One Tin Soldier sung to me as a lullaby, the song from Billy Jack that equated greed with hatred. Of the fairy tales from Grimm, Aesop, and Anderson, and the rest, the one I remember most clearly was Baldwin's story of Genghis Khan and the hawk, in which the king cuts down his favorite bird with a sword after it saves his life over a misunderstanding. The sorry king laments how he has learned a sad lesson, never to act in anger. It would be wrong to conflate anger and hatred, but we cannot dismiss the priming of young minds for dismissing an entire emotional reaction as intrinsically bad. Nor should we ignore the similarity between anger and hatred, which is obvious even to a pre-adolescent boy. The tale of the scorpion and the frog, by contrast, went untold. A scorpion and a frog meet on the bank of a stream, and the scorpion asks the frog to carry him across its back. The frog asks, How do I know you won't sting me? The scorpion says, Because if I do, I will die too. The frog is satisfied and they set out. But in midstream, the scorpion stings the frog. 
The frog feels the onset of paralysis and starts to sink, knowing they both will drown. But he has just enough time to gasp. Why? replies the scorpion. It's my nature. In older times, both stories would have been considered true and relevant, applicable based on context. The balance would give a more holistic and true vision of the many sides of human nature and of wisdom. Nowadays, the choice in emphasis and omission attempts to tell young children a different set of tales, tries to hide the harsher world from children, and disarm them of the tools necessary to take on that harsh world, rather than preparing them for it. Far from being a mere cultural institution, our moral rejection of hatred is enshrined in various codes, bylaws, and government agencies. There are so-called hate crimes, which we are to separate from crimes. The FBI dutifully explains. A hate crime is a traditional offense, like murder, arson, or vandalism, with an added element of bias. For the purpose of collecting statistics, the FBI has defined a hate crime as a criminal offense against a person or property motivated in whole or in part by an offender's bias against a race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, ethnicity, gender, or gender identity. Hate itself is not a crime, and the FBI is mindful of protecting freedom of speech and other civil liberties. For the moment, we still have freedom of speech, however begrudgingly allowed, and for who knows how much longer. Hate speech is illegal in many European countries, and just within the last few months, as I write this in August 2016, police have raided the homes of many ordinary citizens for the horrendous crime of criticizing European immigration policy on Facebook. But speech is not the primary issue here. It is merely an expression of the problem. Hatred bears the dubious honor of being the only emotion which large numbers of people around the world seem bent upon making illegal. If you ever believed Orwellian thought crime to be, at the least, difficult to implement, imagine feel crime for experiencing the wrong emotions. At universities, businesses, clubs, and groups of all sorts, one can be expelled for anything that is perceived to be motivated by hate. At the college I attended in Bellevue, Washington, for instance, bias incidents are against student policy and are grounds for disciplinary action, potentially including expulsion. The school defines it as conduct, speech, or behavior motivated by prejudice or a bias toward another person that does not rise to the level of a crime. That's right. Something that does not rise to the level of a crime can functionally be treated as one in the pseudo-judicious eyes of administrators and academic disciplinary boards. I know this because the school distributes pamphlets which say so, entitled, Don't Let the Haters Win. Bias itself is considered bad. Biased news, biased grading, biased results, all carry a heavy negative connotation of ethical wrongdoing, just barely short of illegality. The big problems we used to discuss at schools, on civics, engineering, physics, or philosophy, are no longer the most important subjects. Now the primary directive of every college is the eradication of a universal emotion and expression, hatred. The problem of hatred is not viewed as universal, however. They seem to be mostly concerned, perhaps only concerned, with the hatred coming from whites, males, heterosexuals, conservatives, and Christians. Being four out of these five, I speak as much from experience as from observation. Preference or bias, is what anti-hate activists are really challenging on moral grounds. After all, how can you hate something without a preference? Hatred cannot be attacked without also attacking the concept of preference, because hatred only comes from a confrontation between something you prefer and oppositional forces in the world. But if you attack preference, does not love itself also come under fire? Love is an act of elevating one thing above others, and if you attack hatred via preference, then love is the collateral damage. The preferences of people that anti-hate activists oppose are the initial targets, but all preferences will eventually fall to this moral attack, including those of the anti-haters themselves. The activists I refer to go by many names. 
progressives, regressives, conservatives, and social justice warriors all might fit under this category. But their work is often done by more ordinary people, people who are not activists, and who might describe themselves as liberal or conservative, but who act as if the most important part of life is to get along with other people. They are agreeable to a fault, but they do not stop there. They will get mad at you if you are not also agreeable to a fault. My argument is not that the negative side effects of hatred are overstated. They are overstated, but that misses the greater moral deception. Hatred is not evil at all. It is a moral good. It is the proper emotion to act on when the situation requires it, because it can be a powerful weapon to protect the people, places, objects, and ideas that you love, including yourself. Failing to act upon it, in fact, is a betrayal of love, and failing to feel it at all is a moral shortcoming that ultimately makes you unlovable. But before going further, let me clarify exactly what I'm talking about when we refer to the emotion called hatred. Defining hatred. The Oxford English Dictionary defines hatred as intense or passionate dislike. This is a useful shorthand definition, but there is no precision or context, and the description is broad. My passionate dislike of asparagus is not the kind of emotion that Mandela, King, or anyone is talking about when they explain the evils of hatred. Merriam-Webster is a bit better. Intense hostility and aversion, usually deriving from fear, anger, or sense of injury, now there is context, a cause, but this definition is still too broad. Hostility from fear is short-lived and is essentially an extension of fear itself. It is not the unique sensation we normally think of when we imagine hatred, and neither is hostility from injury. This we usually call anger, and it is distinct from hatred because it has a moral dimension, justifying itself by the democratic opinion of others. It is less intense, less permanent, and despite its reputation, rarely causes violence or brutality on the scale that hatred can. The Penguin Dictionary of Psychology gets extremely precise in its symptomatic description, calling hatred a deep, enduring, intense emotion expressing animosity, anger, and hostility towards a person, group, or object. Penguin disregards context, but captures the difference in depth between hate and something like anger or annoyance. All of these definitions describe the symptoms of hatred, and one gives us a glimpse of a source, but none of these truly capture its nature sufficiently for the purpose of moral exploration. Note that all three of these definitions use the word intense. Aside from Merriam-Webster, they all miss context, and only Penguin gives us precision. Without grasping the full nature of hatred, we cannot make useful moral judgments about it. We need something better. Freud defined hatred as an ego state that seeks the destruction of the source of its unhappiness. Here we have a cause and a desired resolution. Expressions of intense animosity and hostility are natural if something is making us unhappy. It would be normal for us to want to stop whatever it is that is doing it, and if there is no way to get away from this animus, or to persuade it, or to stop it, peacefully, then it is perfectly logical to destroy it, particularly if unhappiness might include the impending or threatened death of our loved ones or ourselves. Live and let live is nice, but only if they are going to keep their side of the bargain. But hatred does not necessarily mean you want to destroy what you hate. When Achilles withdrew from the attack on Troy, or when Galt shrugged the world and withdrew from society, they were not seeking destruction, though they were certainly acting out of hatred. Destruction is only one possible expression. You might want to keep the object of hate at a distance, or to merely get away from it yourself. You can even imagine a situation where you might want it to survive and to succeed to better show others why it is worth hating and staying away from. And for many, calling hatred an ego state begs the moral judgment of the emotion. 
Ego has become a derogative term for an aspect of the self, packed full of connotations about poor introspection and short-sighted selfishness. It leaves no room to account for hatred on behalf of a loved one or a stranger. It precludes the possibility of deep opposition of principle and insinuates mere personal preference of a more superficial kind. A better and more helpful way of thinking about it can be found by exploring the nature of two other separate but related emotions, anger and disgust. Disgust is among the most powerful emotions we have, and one of the easiest to elicit. And the reason disgust is so powerful is because it is so valuable. Just like fear offers us protective benefits, disgust seems to do the same thing, says Cornell Associate Professor of Psychology David Pizarro. Except for what disgust does is keeps us away not from things that might eat us or heights, but rather things that might poison us or give us disease and make us sick. In other words, it is our involuntary reaction to things that might harm us. Feces, vomit, blood, rotten food, spiders, maggots, all of these things are sources of harm or indicators of harm nearby. The feeling of revulsion towards these things that compels us to avoid them is a survival instinct that keeps us safe. Hatred has a similar feeling to it, being a kind of revulsion. But when we are disgusted by a dead animal, we do not hate it. If something is not choosing to act against us, there is no usefulness in hating it, even if it poses a danger to us. Hatred cannot deter or intimidate a cow pie, nor will we need to work ourselves to a heightened readiness for violence and brutality in order to dispose of a puddle of last night's undercooked chicken lasagna. A pure revulsion is sufficient to keep us safe from these things. Hatred and anger are more complex because they deal with more complex causes. Unlike disgust, anger is always being directed towards a conscious mind. While we may describe being angry at a malfunctioning washing machine, we are usually just being sloppy with our language when we really mean to say annoyed or frustrated. When a person is difficult to work with or bothers us in some way but is not wronging us, they might be irritating or obnoxious. But true anger is reserved for when we are wronged, and only conscious minds can do that. Anger is always directed at people, and because of this, is always marked by its outward expression, indignation at an injustice. It is an appeal to those around you that some wrong has been committed against you, and some sort of compensation is owed. Fundamentally, anger is about fairness, and fairness can only be achieved by showing others that something that just happened is not fair. Now, appeals to fairness depend on other people sharing your view of what is fair, or at least accounting for your opinion in their own. What happens if the unfairness was not accidental or incidental, but intended? What do you call the feeling you experience when you understand that your unhappiness is not a misunderstanding, not an accident, but a matter of the very nature of another person? What is it when you recognize that you will never convince the person that is causing your unhappiness that they are in the wrong? What if the nature of the person, or people, is not just unfair, but is dangerous to you? This is both the source and the nature of hatred, disgust towards mind. Our definition of hatred, then, is as follows. It is the feeling of recognizing fundamental opposition of nature, unconstrained by time or circumstance, as with a simple grievance or general danger. The definition of hatred as discussed towards a conscious mind is useful for three reasons. One, it encapsulates what people generally mean when they say, I hate blank. Two, it seats the word in the context of its psychological origins, making it easier to understand holistically than mere descriptions would, and as a result, easier to judge accurately when we place it under the microscope of game theory, evolution, ethics, and philosophy. 3. It is precisely the emotion that people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, and the anti-hatred culture are referring to when they expound upon the evils of hatred. We see the essence of hate perfectly captured in literature when Achilles tells Hector, Fool, prate not to me about covenants, 
There can be no covenants between men and lions. Wolves and lambs can never be of one mind, but hate each other out and out and through. Therefore there can be no understanding between you and me, nor may there be any covenants between us, till one or other shall fall and glut grim Mars with his life's blood. Because of whose side you are on, what you have done to my cousin, to my men, my friends, and what I know you will continue to do unless I stop you, there is no point in talking. If we were to talk, our words would themselves be swords, attempting to weaken or destroy each other. We are enemies. Like every other definition of hatred, this one might sound a little similar to fear. It feels like there might be some overlap, and as a result, many people have found it convenient to confuse hatred and fear, even overtly conflating the two. Hatred of gays is homophobia. Dislike and distrust of foreigners is xenophobia, etc. A more sophisticated reader may ask why anger and fear were not combined, rather than anger and disgust. At first, this seems more logical and helpful, since the source of hatred is very often the source of fear, a sentient threat, while disgust is triggered by inanimate contaminants. But they are threats experienced over different periods of time. Fear wholly and completely exists in the moment. Hatred can only be felt when someone recognizes that the conflict is in some way eternal and will not pass with time. This is why anger and fear cannot be experienced simultaneously. Robert Plutchnik puts anger and fear on opposite sides of his wheel of emotions, and the degree to which you experience the one, you cannot experience the other, just as you cannot simultaneously experience sadness and joy, interest and distraction disgust and trust, surprise and anticipation. What inspires fear can later transform into hatred, but only once the feeling of fear dies away. Hatred expressed as intimidation, or a call to combat, can easily become an act of provocation if the other side calls your bluff. Put another way, manifest hatred requires courage. If someone is fearful, acting with hate would not be acting on that fear, but overcoming it. This difference is reflected further in how these separate emotions appear in behavior. Like disgust, fear only drives us to action, usually run. There is no showmanship in fear. We might even be ashamed if we show that we are afraid. Hatred, like anger, has an expressive side. Anger says, listen to me. It is an appeal to the natural social instincts towards justice and fairness that we all share. Hatred, by contrast, says, fear me, if it says anything. When hatred is most powerful, we do not want to show it at all. When fear is most powerful, we cannot help but show it, and often do not care that we do. Fear is unthinking and spontaneous, which is perhaps why we do not like to admit that we are scared. It might also be why the anti-haters like to conflate hate and fear. It makes hate out to be uninformed and non-rational, as we imagine fear to be. Some may object to my definition's target, saying you actually can hate an idea or an object or a place. I think this is merely hyperbole, and in many cases just a thin cover for cowardice. An idea cannot harm you without people acting upon it, and ideas are the product of people anyway. Saying that you hate an idea is merely an evasion from saying you hate the people who create or implement the idea. Indeed, you wouldn't even be aware of the idea unless someone was expressing it to you by word or action. Because ideas are never the ones acting against you, hating an idea is as useful as being angry at the washing machine. I promise you, the washing machine will not recognize the injustice, and the idea will not fear you. As for objects and places, caution and dislike are not synonymous with hatred, in our experience of the feelings or in how we act upon them. This is because there is no mind behind objects and places. Perhaps someone might genuinely feel hate towards some inanimate object, but we are no more obliged to take them seriously than we would be if they were angry. A cynical reader 
might think this definition conveniently primes people to see hatred as something that might be beneficial. I do not ordinarily debate cynics, and I especially dislike dealing with criticisms that do not address whether something is true or false. The philosopher Stefan Molyneux habitually labels these kinds of points not an argument. But in case you feel compelled to defend this definition from mind readers, who want to begin this debate on the assumption that hatred is not beneficial in some way, you can give them the following analogy. One of the most persistent myths in pop psychology is that we only use 10% of our brain. We actually use 100% of our brain. What we do not use deteriorates, just like our unused muscles, and then other parts of our brain take over the underused area. One of the prominent theories explaining the phenomenon of phantom limb in which amputees feel sensation on their missing body part, is that when one part of the brain takes over the unused sections that once monitored sensation in the amputated limb, some neurons have not fully changed over. When the amputee is touched on their left foot, for example, it might feel as though they are being touched on their departed left hand, because of the part of their brain responsible for their foot has taken over where the neurons for the unused hand once were. Efficiency is the name of the game, because energy is literally the stuff of life, and any unnecessary use of energy make the challenges of living that much more difficult. Evolution is a ruthless pruner, and hatred takes energy. We all know the feeling of exhaustion after getting particularly angry at a news story or a stressful encounter with a rival at school or work once the adrenaline dies down. Hatred formed too quickly and with poor information can be costly in money, dignity, and freedom. If hatred was an evil emotion, with all these detriments and no counterbalancing benefits, then why is it here? Why the high expenditure of energy if hate is bad? To say that hatred is imprudent would be to claim that all the hundreds of thousands of years spent forging our finely tuned social instincts and skills went wildly wrong from the beginning, and to claim it is immoral would by the same token, separate morality from our survival. Now that civilization has advanced, is hatred still a viable emotion to entertain and value? Surely, liberal democracy and the rule of law have rendered hatred not only unnecessary, but an undesirable and dangerous facet of the human psyche. Better to train people out of it, or if need be, perhaps even genetically prune this character quality away from our species. Such positions seem to be held explicitly by many of the visionary architects of some future utopian society, and are tacitly held by a surprisingly high number of lay people. Yet to view civilization as a justification for the elimination of hatred is to put the proverbial cart before the horse. If civilization is of any use at all, it is because it is a positive, adaptive environment for human beings to thrive in, and human beings have hatred built into them. The transhumanist position that this part of human nature should be sliced off views the human psyche as a compartmentalized structure. We do not know very much about the human brain, and the more we learn, the more we realize how little we know, but the interconnected nature of many of our neural systems is very nearly concrete proof that human beings are not compartmentalized collections of emotions, from which one or two can be easily or simply removed. As I hope to show in this book, hatred is quite inextricably entangled with many things of which we should never, ever let go. The human being, and not civilization, is the end goal. Whether civilization, or democracy, or any other social institution, is the proper means for human preservation and flourishing is the question. The question cannot be, is the human being the best means for the preservation of civilization? If hatred truly is incompatible with civilization, and if civilization is, as it is imagined in the minds of those who advocate it over human nature itself, the best thing for the preservation and flourishing of humanity, then we would do better to trust evolution to naturally trim away those whom civilized society finds to be maladaptive in their hatefulness, rather than taking proactive measures. After all, evolution is far more trustworthy than the humans who attempt to help it along. 
humans who are almost universally wrong about what the future will require of man and how man works as it pertains to the changes they seek to implement. Needless to say, this is almost never their proposed course of action. The question, then, is not whether hate is beneficial, but when. When is hatred justified? When is it dangerous? How finely calibrated should our hate response be, and how fast should it accelerate from zero to sixty? These questions require an accurate, precise, and complete definition of hate to answer. The definition of hate, as discussed towards mind, does not answer these questions by itself, but it does make attempting to answer the question possible in a way that Oxford, Merriam-Webster, Penguin, and even Freud do not.